Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shinryu. And here we are on the last day of our retreat and the last day of our year. And what a year it's been, huh? Um, I've talked to uh, enough of you, and based on my own experience, um, I have a sense that for many of us, it's been uh, a challenging year, a difficult year. And I don't think I need to go into the litany of calamities that have befallen us for, for, you, know, for you to know what I'm talking about. Enkyo Roshi yesterday uh, mentioned a number of the political calamities, but there's layer upon layer. So we're very fortunate to be here together to practice and to support each other at the end of the year. I was really looking forward to this retreat. I knew it would be good for me, and it has been just what the doctor ordered. And uh, talking to a number of you, I've also sensed that you had a good retreat. Um, my impression is that the retreat has flowed really, really well. So I too want to thank our Shuso for who has uh, stepped up and been there from day one and everyone else who's been uh, working to make this happen and overseeing it um, as it's happened uh, this week. Our Shuso said something on the first morning that stuck with me. He said, it's such a relief to just to be able to take things as they come. And I have felt that relief on the retreat. And I thought it was actually a perfect way to describe session. If we can just follow the schedule and surrender to the structure, uh, then we can just take things as they come. And we've had the uh, good guidance of our Dharma speakers throughout these days. Um, every talk has been just wonderful. Tokyo started us off um, easing us into the retreat, telling us to uh, feel things out with a light touch and see, see how we want to enter in. And he began to open up the first verse of our study text, the Shodoka, uh, talking about um, the way in which the leisurely one can flow without falling into the uh, routine ruts and grooves. And he gave us some vivid examples of that kind of flow with his own musical maestros. And Ryotan Roshi also further opened up the first verse, um, looking at how the leisurely one flows so naturally and so effortlessly, so that uh, we don't have to strive for something that we don't have. And in fact, we already are in the very place that we have been striving to reach. I am Brooklyn, and all things are Brooklyn. And Joshin Roshi uh, worked this line from the koan, it's just you from birth until death, and talked about how to become mature human beings we have to recognize our limitations and our flaws and our mistakes, and also recognize that there are other people at the table. And be careful about that tendency, that spiritual trap, to cling to emptiness as an escape from our karma and our suffering. To see that the whole mess is mine, the great responsibility. And Enkyo Roshi uh, explored the, uh, the way in which when we um, try to hold to the truth and push away delusion, that very subtle kind of discrimination 
can lead to othering and polarization and conflict and harm. And she gave us the uh, inspiring words of Dr. King to think about how we can uh, resist the urge to fall into that kind of othering and hold open a kind of possibility that allows us to see uh, the mystery at work in the world and then to be able to offer that openness to others. So I too had initially thought that I would speak about the first verse, but since that was so well covered, I'll offer another one to you. And it goes, um, always acting alone, always walking alone, the enlightened one roams the path of nirvana with a tune that is ancient and clear in spirit and naturally elegant in style with a body that is tough and bony, passing unnoticed in the world. This first line, uh, acting, always acting alone, uh, always walking alone, is just a fundamental uh, fact of our existence, right? I mean, no one else can live our life for us. Our teachers cannot do our practice for us. The Sangha, much as we love it, cannot do the work for us. Even Buddha cannot save us. In fact, we have to save Buddha. The old Zen teachers had a, a um, scatological streak, a uh, sense of humor, which I think was intended to kind of get rid of the whiff of holiness and sanctity. So Koto Sawaki said, no one else can take a shit for you. So this first line is, is exactly what Joshin Roshi was talking about. It's just you from birth until death. And it says, the enlightened one roams the path of nirvana. And in that roaming, I hear the leisurely one and the, uh, this, this great freedom roaming the path in the Tao of Satori, of, sorry, of Nirvana. Nirvana, the extinction of self, no self, the emptiness uh, in which uh, there is no fixed identity because everything is in constant transformation in connection with everything else. So these, these two lines, they, they fit together perfectly like a box and its lid. All we have to work with is this very body and this very heart mind that we've inherited. Our unique individuality shaped by all of our karma and conditioning. This is what we have to work with as ourself. But when we roam the path of nirvana, uh, we are uh, living no self in constant flux and interconnection with all things. So when we take a shit, the whole universe is shitting with us. And it goes on the, uh, with a tune that is ancient and uh, clear in spirit and naturally elegant in style. Maybe Tokyo's teacher uh, Barry Harris would say, with an ancient rhythm. Ancient because it has no beginning and no end, no birth and no death. It is clear with no wrong notes, no blemishes or stains. And it is naturally elegant in style, natural like the, the turning of the seasons or the days lengthening or growing shorter and elegant like the Buddha Shakyamuni and all the uh, Buddhas and ancestors, noble like the Bodhisattva. 
but with a body that is tough and bony. This, um, this skin bag of ours, this bag of bones, with its uh, rough edges, uh, its sharp edges, its um, calluses. Again, uh, the two lines go together. This body and this heart-mind of ourself, completely unique, is what we have to uh, follow that ancient tune. Without, that has no beginning or end to it, without birth or death. And thus, the leisurely one uh, passes unnoticed through the world because uh, the leisurely one is so ordinary. It's all so simple and, and natural, nothing special. There isn't, the leisurely one doesn't give off some uh, shiny glow. And I thought Josh, uh, Joshin's comments yesterday about uh, charismatic spiritual figures and the projections of their followers, all that is very applicable here. No, this is something that's just very, very ordinary. Nothing special. So this, this teaching of the leisurely one is, is very beautiful. Um, and I think we all yearn for that, especially after a hard year like the one that we've had. We all want that. We want the leisure. We want to be able to breathe easy um, and be carefree. But I think we have to be careful here. And uh, there can be a kind of trap if we misunderstand what the leisurely one is all about. I don't think that Yongja is referring to a uh, a kind of um, fantasy in which we are dancing around with a big smile on our face in some heavenly realm and without a care in the world. I don't think that's what it's all about. And so we have to really look at it um, more honestly and be more real about it in terms of our own life and our own practice. And I think that a good way to see to gain some insight into that is through our own zazen practice. Our zazen practice these days, our zazen practice this afternoon. I think that that's what Yongja is actually getting at. When Dogen came back from China to Japan, um, one of the first things that he wrote was a kind of beginning instruction for his monks, uh, the Fukanza Zangi. Uh, universal recommendation for Zazen. And what's interesting is, is that there is a first version of it um, that he later became uncomfortable with, and he ended up deleting a passage of it and replacing it with another passage. And it's, it's instructive, I think, to look at what he first wrote and then what he changed it to. So um, uh, the first version in the first version, he said, talking about Zazen, do not think of any good or evil whatsoever. Whenever a thought occurs, be aware of it. As soon as you're aware of it, it will vanish. If you remain for a long period forgetful of objects, you will naturally become unified. So, uh, don't think of any good or evil whatsoever. Don't create those, those thoughts and labels. Whenever a thought occurs, be aware of it. And as soon as you're aware of it, it will vanish. It sounds kind of like what we tell people in our own beginning instruction. Just be aware of the thoughts. That's all you have to do. And, and Ryotan, I noticed, said something that sounded a lot like this, although it's actually a little different. He said, um, thoughts flow from our brains and reveal themselves as empty. But Dogen says, your thoughts will just vanish. And then he goes on to say, um, if you remain for a long period forgetful of objects, you'll naturally become unified. So that unification is, you know, the concentration. Session means the, 
um, uh, collecting the parts of the spirit into, into a unity. But he says, um, just forget objects. And after a while, you'll be unified. So uh, there is a way in which here the emphasis is on making your thoughts vanish and obliterating the objects of perception, sensation, emotion, thought. And I think that that's what uh, Dogen uh, eventually became uncomfortable with. And so he substituted that passage with another one that you'll be that will sound familiar to you if you know the, the Fukan Zazengi. He said, Zazen is not the practice of dhyana. It is just the Dharma gate of ease and joy. It is the practice and verification of ultimate bodhi. So Zazen is not the practice of dhyana. Dhyana is the Sanskrit term for meditation. And normally it refers to a, a kind of contemplation absorption and concentration. Uh, but Dogen saying Zazen is not any kind of meditation technique whatsoever. It's something completely different. Um, it's the Dharma gate of ease and joy. And so rather than uh, block out objects or make them vanish, he gives us the image of this gate, which is so wide the broad gate, Komon. This gate that is so wide that anything and everything can enter in and nothing is excluded. That is the ease and joy that can support everything. And practice is not a means to get to enlightenment, he's saying. He's saying that practice is the manifestation of enlightenment, and enlightenment is the manifestation of practice. So uh, I think it's helpful for us uh, to look at this um, and not to see our, our meditation practice just as a way to try to um, relax after a hard year. Um, it's not just a program for physical improvement or psychological improvement. There may be some benefits that come from doing it. That's, that's certainly true, but that's ultimately not what it's about. It's not um, uh, trying to um, generate huge amounts of energy so you can blast off into some kind of blissful trance state. Mm -hmm and be above the fray and, and escape from your karma and suffering. He's talking about a, um, a state in which we can just manifest reality as it is. Take things as they come, as our Shuso said, um, and allow everything in and not have to exclude anything to get to any place else. So uh, what does this look like beyond the cushion uh, in our own lives? Um, Tokyo gave us Charlie Parker's um, line, master your instrument, master the music, and then forget all the bullshit and just play. So what is your instrument? What's the instrument that you have? And what's your music? And how can you play it? Maybe the leisurely one uh, is just able to stay present when he's feeling the dull ache of a sinus headache. Maybe the leisurely one is just able to take a breath after opening the paper and reading the new, latest story about banning books in public schools, or hearing about the latest effort to eliminate Medicare benefits for the poor, or to, to hear about uh, 
Buddhist monks participating in the genocide of Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. Maybe the leisurely one is burnt out from too much time on the computer screen and just steps out the door and roams the boulevard mixing in with the crowd. Maybe the leisurely one lets his heart be broken when he hears that a dear companion um, has suffered a grave accident. Maybe, maybe the leisurely one lets tears flow when she hears that she's lost two old friends. Flowing completely naturally. Can you see the leisurely one? In years past at the village Zendo, we used to do an exercise where uh, everyone would formulate a vow for the new year, and then they'd hold it close to themselves uh, when they would go up to ring the big bell at the final year end ceremony. And uh, we couldn't do that last year, but I did suggest ways in which you might want to formulate a vow for the new year. But I thought this year it, it's really not in keeping with the Shodoka to vow to attain anything in the new year or to vow to leave anything behind from the old year. But Tokyo reminded us that we all took a vow on the first night during our Ango entry. So I'm going to just read you again the vow that you took. Remembering that Ango means peaceful dwelling, or maybe we could say leisurely dwelling, and in keeping with the theme of practice in our homes, offices, streets, and neighborhoods, we vow to realize ourselves in the midst of activity, in the midst of our daily lives. So we're fortunate to be here together. We're fortunate to have our Zazen practice, the teachings, and the support of one another um, to help us see that our lives are already the realization of ultimate reality. And uh, to help us see that when we let go of the true and stop pushing away the false, holding to one side and shunning the other, then this vow is already fulfilled in this very moment. Thank you very much. <laughs>